Thank you for joining us today in the latest installment of the project on China's Global Sharp Tower speaker series. Today, we have a special guest coming to us directly from Shanghai. Richard Carney engages in political economy research with a focus on business government relations. He received his PhD in political science from the University of California, San Diego. He's the author of Authoritarian Capitalism, published by Cambridge University Press in 2018, and is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Strategy and Entrepreneurship in the China Europe International Business School in Shanghai, as I said. He's also an advisor to the World Bank for its flagship project, Businesses of the State. His next book, which he's going to talk about with us today, China's Chance to Lead, will be published later this year by Cambridge University Press. Richard, thank you for joining us today. Thank Over you. to you. Thank you very much, Glenn. And thank you to all of you for coming today. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to share the research I've put into this project with you. And I'm looking forward to your questions and comments later. Um, so let me begin with the question that's motivating uh, my project. Uh, so the question is, why does Chinese foreign spending on infrastructure and digital technology exports vary across countries? And just to give you a little bit of background, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but just so we're all on the same page, you'll recall that President Xi uh, became president formally in March, 2013. In September, 2013, he announced the launch of the Silk Road while he was on a visit to Kazakhstan, connecting China to Europe over the Eurasian landmass. And then he, on a trip to Indonesia in October of that year, announced the Maritime Silk Road. Both of these announcements were directed toward the infrastructure component of the Belt and Road Initiative. 18 months later, in March 2015, there was an announcement made by the National Development and Reform Commission regarding information connectivity. And this has later been called the beginnings of the digital Silk Road part. I want to pose a puzzle to you to motivate the analysis here and the argument that I'm going to uh, offer. So Indonesia, as I mentioned, was the location where he made this big announcement about infrastructure in the context of the maritime portion of the Silk Road. The amount of Chinese foreign spending going into Indonesia from 2012, the year before the announcement, up through 2016, almost didn't change. It was flat, about $3.75 billion in 2012, and about $3.77 billion in 2016. And there were almost no significant digital technology projects that were initiated in Indonesia. Okay, so that's just uh, what I just mentioned. And I'm on the bottom part where I'm talking about this puzzle. Um, so Indonesia had virtually no change be between the year before the project was announced in Jakarta in 2013 uh, till several years later in 2016. Malaysia, on the other hand, experienced this very significant increase, in fact, over a 100% increase in Chinese foreign spending going into the country from around three and a half billion to over eight and a half billion. And also it launched some major uh, digital tech projects, including the digital free trade zone with Alibaba in 2017. And Kuala Lumpur became the first city outside China to adopt Alibaba's smart city platform, CityBrain. So, the puzzle is heightened when you consider some other characteristics of Indonesia and Malaysia. So Indonesia's economy is three times larger than Malaysia's. It also has a population nine times larger than Malaysia's. Indonesia was also a major natural resources exporter to China uh, before its launch, whereas Malaysia was not. And Indonesia's GDP per capita is far lower than Malaysia's, or was at the time, and still is, uh, about 3,600 
uh, US dollars uh, GDP per capita compared to Malaysia's, which was nearly 11,000. And finally, Indonesia's government was a democracy. It was democratic, it's still consolidating, but nevertheless, it had checks and balances, which typically are regarded as promoting policy stability and reducing political risk for foreign investors. And that's typically regarded as attractive for foreign investment. Malaysia's government was autocratic, right? I mean, they had elections, but they were semi-competitive, which means the incumbent was regarded as being the heavy favorite to win. So all these characteristics suggest Indonesia should be very well positioned to attract a far larger volume of Chinese foreign spending. But as I said, it didn't, it was flat. Malaysia jumped by over 100% during the next four years. Why? So existing explanations to explain Chinese foreign spending focus overwhelmingly on China's characteristics, right? And they try to understand the motivations for China's uh, political and economic uh, elites uh, and why they are trying to do what they're trying to do. There is a very big gap coming at this from the other perspective, that is the demand side. So we could think of China as the supply side. Uh, the demand side is all these recipient countries. Typical explanations regarding the demand side have come from thinking about foreign investment with regard to the interests of private business. And so many of those characteristics I showed you a moment ago, uh, such as checks and balances, reducing policy risk, those are especially important for private business. Another common explanation is thinking about whether a country falls along a dem democracy autocracy <laughs> continuum, a sort of linear approach to thinking about political regimes. Now, I'm going to argue that we need a new approach to understanding recipient country characteristics that are salient to Chinese foreign spending. And I argue that political regimes have two characteristics that are especially helpful for understanding why countries vary in the way they attract Chinese foreign spending. The first is the public-private orientation of the corporate sector. In other words, how prevalent is the state in the corporate sector? How large a share of ownership of the biggest companies do they have? How much control do they exert? And the second characteristic is clientelism. By clientelism, I mean, do the political leaders depend upon allocating resources to certain groups in the country in order to secure their political support? This first characteristics of a uh, characteristic of political regimes, the public-private orientation builds on my previous book, Authoritarian Capitalism. The novel theoretical uh, approach in this book is about the clientelism and applying this whole, this whole approach to explaining Chinese foreign spending. Okay, so let me explain now exactly what the argument is. And I wanna begin with closed autocracies. So closed autocracies are those countries that do not hold elections or do not hold multi-party elections of any kind. So an example of a closed autocracy is China or Saudi Arabia or North Korea. Um, in, those, in the context of those countries, there typically is a small group of elite loyal supporters of the regime. And often in the context of Saudi Arabia, or you might even think the UAE, they are wealthy business owners, wealthy merchants, right? And they will, they are the ones who need to be um, major uh, partners with the regime in ensuring that the regime retains political uh, leadership and, and um, I guess legitimacy in a way, insofar as they are catering to this particular group of elites. 
right, to remain in power. Sometimes these closed autocracies will introduce elections. And that's where you get these semi-competitive authoritarian regimes. Now, when you hold an election as an autocrat, typically you're doing so in order to demonstrate the legitimacy of your rule, right? To at least suggest that there is popular support for your being uh, elected leader, for you holding a, the leadership position of the country. The consequence of that means those leaders must allocate a larger share of clientelist resources to a larger swath of the population. So in a closed autocracy, they're really focusing the allocation of their resources to a relatively narrow group. They can use repression on a larger segment of the population who they don't allocate these resources to. But once you begin introducing elections, you need to widen the group of people to whom you're allocating these clientelist resources. So electoral autocracies exhibit a greater demand for clientelist resources because of these semi-competitive elections that they hold. So as a consequence, there is a higher demand for Chinese foreign spending in the context of these electoral autocracies than in closed autocracies. Because those semi-competitive authoritarian leaders want those resources to allocate so that they can secure political support to remain in power. Sometimes they lose, that does happen, and they are worried about losing the next election. So they, what they're mainly concerned about is maintaining the veneer of legitimacy for the whole world. Electoral democracies hold genuinely competitive multi-party elections. The difference between electoral democracies and liberal democracies is the institutions of electoral democracies are still weak. By that, I mean, for example, the legal system can be politically influenced relatively easily, for example, or there's generally a high level or higher level of corruption in electoral democracies than in liberal democracies. And so in electoral democracies, you also can see demand for Chinese foreign spending. However, the role of the state is typically reduced in the context of electoral democracies because a lot of what the state would otherwise do has been moved to these private business owners. So the large family business conglomerates, you can think of Indonesia, India, Brazil, as compared to large electoral autocracies, such as Russia or Malaysia, as I mentioned a moment ago, or Turkey is another electoral autocracy. In those places, the state tends to be much more influential and to have larger ownership stakes over the biggest companies on average. Um, and so in liberal democracies, then you're going to have the lowest demand for Chinese foreign spending because they have the lowest need for clientelist resources to allocate to potential voters. Because typically that's regarded as a form of corruption. Okay, so they're not going to be able to easily allocate those resources uh, without facing criticism from their political opponents. Okay, so the evidence in the book is, includes 17 data sets. Uh, many are unique and newly self-collected, altogether encompassing more than 20 million firm year observations across more than 150 countries. Uh, there's also some detailed case studies on countries representing each of these different political regimes. So the UAE for closed autocracy, Djibouti, uh, Malaysia for electoral autocracy, Indonesia for the electoral democracy, and Greece as a liberal democracy. The common feature across each of these regimes is they each have a major port project initiated by China, which allows for a uh, basis of comparison in the way uh, these projects are executed. And finally, the research that has gone into this is based upon 
extensive discussions and interviews I've conducted with hundreds of Chinese and foreign executives through the teaching I've done at the China Europe International Business School in Shanghai. And I can talk more about that later if you're interested. Okay, so I'm just going to show you a couple highlights of the evidence because there's a lot of data. I think I'll show you just what I think is some highlights. So this figure shows you the foreign construction spending in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative by political regime. So remember the BRI started in 2013, at the end of 2013. So that's why you see a relatively low number in 2013. And then you see high numbers after that. The dashed line. Can I ask is, how are you identifying, how, are you, how do you classify each of these regimes? What's your basis? Yeah, so this comes from uh, the uh, regimes of the world data set, which is uh, created from the V Dem Varieties okay. of Democracy. The varieties of Democracy project. Right, yes. So it, I don't, it's not my own subjective. Great. Yeah. Perfectly correct. Okay. Um, so you can see the dashed line at the top. It represents electoral autocracies. And it's a pretty remarkable difference. Um, it's about three to four times higher on average than the next two categories, which represent electoral democracy and closed autocracy. And the bottom is liberal democracy. You might ask, well, what proportion of the global economy do electoral autocracies represent? Or what fraction of all countries do electoral autocracies represent? And I'll show you that in a moment. But I just want to tell you that the numbers you see here are far higher than either of those proportions. So there's something going on, something about electoral autocracies that makes them especially avid recipients of Chinese foreign infrastructure spending. <clears throat> I supplement, so I should just quickly mention that the data source for the foreign investment data comes from this China Global Investment Tracker database, which is compiled by Derek Scissors at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, DC. It's been used by the World Bank and the OECD to study China's Belt and Road Initiative. So it's, I think, also a credible representation of Chinese foreign spending. I supplement that data with project level data, which comes from Refinitiv, uh, the Refinitiv BRI database. So Thomson Reuters in collaboration with, uh, I wanna say BlackRock, but I, I don't, Blackstone, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so they're the ones who have compiled this data and they uh, give descriptions of each project. So there's over 2000 projects that are used in this data set. And, 10 different characteristics were coded for each of those projects. So it was a huge endeavor. Um, and you can see, I want, I want to highlight just a couple points here. And what you can see on the bottom is the breakdown of all these projects by political regime, the proportion. And you can see it's consistent uh, that electoral <laughs> autocracies have a far higher share of these projects than the next category. So, Electoral democracies is about half of electoral autocracies. So this you know, gives you some confidence for the findings of that previous slide uh, using a completely different data set. The other thing I wanna highlight here, which is quite interesting, is the percentage of projects completed of those initiated by category. Now you might think Liberal democracies are the ones most likely to follow through on their commitments, on their promises, right? When they engage in a contract to have something built, it will likely get built. Surprisingly, they are by far the lowest of many of these regime categories to have the project completed. And the highest is electoral autocracies. That's, I mean, I can give you my interpretation of that, I'll save that for later, but it's just an interesting artifact that emerges from the data here. These are very low completion rates. Yes. Is that because some of them are still ongoing? I think, the I think that's partly what it comes for that. 
I, I just want to show you one other uh, piece of evidence uh, from the project level data. So what I'm highlighting here are six different China SOE characteristics. And what this is showing you is the difference in proportions between electoral autocracies and each of the other regime types. So for example, electoral autocracy may have 20, if we look at owner China SOE, we see 0 0.03, 0 0.03, which suggests electoral autocracies may have 25% of the projects where the, a Chinese SOE is the owner, only 22% uh, for closed autocracies where a China SOE is the owner. So that's essentially what that means. And so what you can see here is regardless of the regime that you're comparing electoral autocracies to, Chinese SOEs are always more, uh, have, have Chinese SOEs are more involved in these projects in the context of electoral autocracies. The other thing I wanna highlight is the host country SOE. And again, you can see electoral autocracies, SOEs, are always more involved in these projects than the SOE of the other political regime. So there's, for both of them, there's a greater involvement, China SOEs and host country SOEs in the context of electoral autocracies. And finally, what's especially interesting is the difference for financing. So you can see that for electoral autocracies and closed autocracies on the left column there, closed autocracies don't have a much smaller reliance on Chinese financing. And that's probably because many of them are oil rich monarchies. <laughs> and you also see a very low, even lower reliance on Chinese financing for liberal democracies. And that's because typically they can rely on more private sources of financing. So the crucial difference then is uh, electoral autocracies and electoral democracies. That's where you see a smaller difference. And I just wanna give you one highlight or a couple highlights, I guess, from these figures about the digital exports. And specifically, this is about aid. And this comes from the aid data, uh, data set uh, developed by people at William & Mary. It's version two, so it goes up to 2017. It's their latest version of the data. The left figure so shows you Chinese information and communications technology, total amount of aid commitments. And notice in 2015, when there's the launch of the digital Silk Road, there's a spike in aid going to electoral autocracies. And there's a divergence in, over the next couple of years with respect to electoral democracies. Now you might say that total amount of aid may be driven by one project, for example. So on the right side, I show you the number of aid commitments and it displays a similar pattern. Right. Clearly, there's something different happening from 2015 onward. And that coincides with the launch of the digital Silk Road. OK, why does this matter? There are three main reasons. One is that China's infrastructure development initiatives are important and helpful for reducing poverty around the world. Right, and I, in two ways, actually. One way is that just on its face, by building infrastructure, they can help alleviate poverty. The second way is indirect, by spurring competition with advanced economies, who then may feel the need to also allocate more funding to develop infrastructure in these developing economies. So that's quite a beneficial outcome, I would argue. And many of the projects that they're developing are going into industrial parks, port facilities, urbanization projects, transport and logistics. And often these are sold together 
as something called a Fort Park City model. Um, so this actually is intended to sort of replicate the development of Shenzhen, uh, with the Sheku, it's called the Sheku model, uh, the, the fishing village that sort of led into the development of Shenzhen, uh, what it is today. So they tell other countries, we can help you build something like Shenzhen, or would you like to build something like Shenzhen? We can help you do that. The second reason why it matters is because introducing these infrastructure projects can then allow for the introduction of digital technology exports and Chinese technical standards that can lock in that country and its businesses and consumers into Chinese product, products and services. <laughs> and even if other technical standards from Western companies are better, it will be, China's hoping, it will be too costly for those customers and countries to change. In essence, they're, they're stuck with what China is offering them. And this creates huge advantages as you would expect. Um, and these are happening across a wide range of digital technology products. As you can see listed there, e-commerce logistics, smart cities. This is something China, as you many of you know, is hugely invested in. Smart manufacturing and industry 4.0. This goes, this is affiliated with the building of industrial parks. Telecommunications, financial services, and all together uh, yielding uh, this outcome that I just mentioned about locking out Chinese competitors and keeping Chinese uh, Chinese companies uh, in with an advantage. And then finally, the third important reason why it matters is because this can enable China to align uh, different countries' development strategies for regional efforts that grant them economies of scale and scope that they would not otherwise enjoy if they were fragmented in the way that they develop. Uh, they can also align their regulatory and technical standards, reducing transaction costs. They can enhance cross-national trade and investment. And finally, altogether, this can increase the interdependence among these countries and the connectivity which places China at the center. Okay, now I wanna talk about three trends that seem likely to increase China's influence globally over the coming years, if, if not decades. The first trend is the retreat of democracy. Second is global economic growth. And third is urbanization. So first is the retreat of democracy. So we've seen democracy increasing across low and middle income countries since 1980. However, starting about a decade ago, autocracies have been on the rise. And in fact, if you look at the share of the world population living in autocracies, in 2011, it was about 49%. A decade later, in 2021, it was 70%. So in some, Largely because India is no longer a democracy. Is that, okay. So if you go by the VDEM, <laughs> which I have come to agree with. Okay, so that's that's where this data yeah, there goes from. Eighteen percent of world population, <laughs> right there. So, so insofar as China's increasing ties with electoral autocracies is important, this this is a significant uh, pattern. And just to give you a sense of where, this is from 2019, so it doesn't account for what you just mentioned, Larry. Thank you for that. You can see that many of these electoral autocracies are clustered in Africa and Central Asia. And so what's interesting is that uh, what I've shown you so far, the evidence is descriptive. I, don't, I haven't shown you regression analyses controlling for alternative explanatory variables, such as natural resource endowments and so forth. I've run those regressions and I control for those. And the political regime variable remains statistically significant. And so it's, I'm not saying that natural resources don't matter, they do. But I would argue that 
political regime characteristics are important and overlooked, as the example of Malaysia, I think, nicely illustrates. The second trend is global economic growth. And you can see here, this is from the IMF, that since around the year 2000, emerging and developing economies have grown at more than twice the rate of advanced economies. And they're projected to continue that trend over the next several years, right? as you can see at the end of that figure. Right? So COVID was a temporary interruption to that elevated growth rate. And so I think what's important to take away is how this has changed the share of global GDP that each of these countries contributes to. So in 1990, emerging developing economies contributed about 39% uh, to global GDP, advanced economies 61%. That's nearly reversed. Right, and it is going to continue to widen in the next decade at least. So, as I showed you on the previous map, 70% of global population is living in autocracies. And with India becoming an electoral autocracy now, that's, that's the largest share of political regimes in the world, uh, countries having electoral autocratic regimes. And if these emerging economies, developing countries are predominantly autocratic, then China is going to be at the center of the group of countries that contributes to over to nearly two thirds of global GDP by the end of the decade. The third trend is urbanization rates. And I mentioned that China's infrastructure development efforts are often geared towards developing uh, new cities or port park city projects, but also smart cities and urbanization efforts replicating what they have accomplished in mainland China. And so it's natural to look at where urbanization is happening the fastest to see where China may have the biggest chance at assisting infrastructure development. And so if you look across the world, according to the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, up to 2030, it's African countries. And recall, they are predominantly electoral autocracies. So these various trends, I mean, I'm just pointing out for the next decade, basically, to 2030, but I think these trends are likely to continue past that, in, or there's good arguments to think they, they could continue past that. Uh, so the implications, I just want to draw a couple implications. One is uh, with regard to semiconductor technology. So there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, the chip war and uh, the effort to hold China back from developing leading edge semiconductor uh, manufacturing capabilities. Now, that may be successful, but I think it ignores the bigger problem of China potentially capturing uh, or not capturing, but having uh, predominant influence over the group of countries that contributes to nearly two thirds of global GDP by the end of the decade. And so even if they are not at the leading edge, they can satisfy the demand of these low and middle income countries with lagging edge semiconductor technology that's adequate to meet their demands. And if they have access to the resources available from this large share of the global GDP, surely they will in time catch up to the leading edge. So what should the US and its allies do? So one, I would argue, is there needs to be stronger government support for private firms to compete in developing countries. So, one of the major challenges for private companies to be willing to invest in infrastructure projects in these low and middle, middle income countries is uh, the risk they face, the costs of doing business in those countries. And these costs in part are elevated by the FCPA, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And so I'm not suggesting the government 
change that. Rather, I'm suggesting the government needs to provide some additional financial assistance so that Western companies can compete and not give away the market to Chinese firms without putting up a good fight. And second, there needs to be stronger multilateral government arrangements to assist private firms, not just the US government with respect to its own firms, but multilaterally in the context of, well, maybe the Asian Development Bank or the African Development Bank or the World Bank, for example. But you know, there was an effort with the Build Back Better World project that didn't really go anywhere. There needs to be a much stronger, you know, more uh, bigger commitment, a meaningful commitment to making that happen. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, I want to encourage the members of our online audience who are coming in over Zoom to pose their questions by clicking on the Q&A button. Uh, I will take a cue of hands here in the room, but I'd like to prime the discussion um, by pursuing that point a little bit further. Um, you know, the United States and Europeans have both announced initiatives that are designed to challenge China, but coordination here is the key across countries, but also within borders. How can the U.S. actually do better um, to get the aid where countries need it, to organize our political systems and economic systems very different than China's, which can provide turnkey solutions in a way that the U.S. generally does not? Um, is that the path that we should follow? By organizing coalitions of firms to present entire port projects from A to Z, the way China does? Um, yeah. So, Thanks, great question. Um, so one of the challenges I think that organizations like the World Bank faces, and they're sort of at the leading edge of addressing these infrastructure needs, mm -hmm. is they are explicitly apolitical. And so they do not differentiate with respect to a country's political regime when deciding the appropriateness of whether a country deserves an infrastructure project. But the problem here is that I think it's, you have an explicitly political uh, logic driving the kinds of projects that are being implemented across countries. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of uh, defangs uh, anything that the World Bank could do. I mean, they're already defanged because of the mission of, of the bank being explicitly apolitical. So there needs to be some compensating uh, mechanism that is more explicitly tied to uh, the political uh, drivers of the infrastructure, of what's driving these infrastructure investments to compete effectively, yeah. Larry. So um, I think one could argue that the situation is even more alarming <laughs> than you uh, articulated in the following respects. Um, First of all, um, we're seeing more signs of closed autocracies, for example, Saudi Arabia uh, and electoral democracies. For example, um, Lula just was in China, um, really deepening their financial and uh, economic relationships with the PRC as all of these other trends proceed. Second of all, um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about how China's move into a digital yuan will affect things. We produced a report on uh, China's movement to um, a central bank digital currency that we can give you if you don't have it. Um, and of course, this is a gradual phenomenon, but we're starting to see uh, agreements to denominate trade in, in the renminbi rather than the dollar. And the third thing I would note is that, um, you know, we also had a, pro a project of which Glenn and I um, uh, were involved in, Glenn wrote a hand, co-authored a handbook on China's uh, penetration of Sub-Saharan Africa, in part politically. And so China's sharp power uh, projections 
has been part of the factor that has landed a growing number of these African countries in the electoral autocracy category, frequently moving them. So that's not an entirely independent variable. It partly follows from the logic of the Chinese relationship and its corrupting influence. Um, so that's all on the negative side of the ledger. Uh, looks like things are looking worse. On the other side, there have been reports that China just doesn't have the money anymore to put into global infrastructure development uh, because of its own uh, financial disarray and budget exigencies. Um, and so uh, could you comment on both sides of those ledgers, um, of the ledger? those developments that look like they may be accelerating and intensifying the story of China's rise um, and increasingly favorable competitive position, and also what China's internal difficulties financially uh, may mean for the future of those. Okay, thank you. That's a big question. Sorry. Multiple questions. But you got plenty of time. So I don't go <laughs> All right. So um, let me talk about China, the China side first with regard, I guess I'll talk uh, first about um, uh, digital currencies. Um, I think this is, uh, I mean, two things. One, this is a natural outgrowth of the emergence of digital uh, transactions in the domestic Chinese economy. So it's just, it's not like, a, it, on the one hand, it's not necessarily a geopolitical effort to undermine the dollar, um, although it may be turning out that way. Um, but it's very much a domestically you know, emerging phenomenon just because everybody relies on electric uh, currency payments. Um, but related to that, I mean, I, I'm sure that they are seeing the benefits of transitioning to this form of cross-country or bilateral uh, payment mechanisms. And so they're taking advantage of this to evade going through U.S. Uh, banks when they have to do these bilateral cross-national uh, payments. So, and that's the future. Uh, you know, they're, they're increasingly moving that direction. I think the one weakness of the push in that direction is China's uh, currency is not uh, a reserve currency. And I don't think central banks around the world want to hold, hold it as a reserve currency. So that's going to significantly limit its ability to replace the dollar uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, but that said, there are these this other <laughs> trend moving in the direction. Um, uh, with regard to, yeah, so I think you make a great point that China's infrastructure spending, uh, it pushes countries towards uh, that may be on the weak electoral democracies and China's spending may push those countries in the direction of autocracy, electoral autocracy, absolutely. And in fact, I mentioned that I do case studies on two electoral autocracies, Malaysia, <laughs> and Djibouti, and it's precisely to look at whether weak electoral autocracies are more avid recipients of Chinese spending than strong electoral <clears throat> autocracies. So Malaysia was weak, Najib knew he was in a precarious position <clears throat> leading up to the 2018 election, and it was that dynamic that led him to so aggressively pursue Chinese spending to help him shore up political support through the allocation of Chinese projects. Um, whereas Djibouti's leader has had very weak political opposition. And so he hasn't had to be as aggressive in, although they have had a lot of Chinese foreign spending come in, it's not to, as aggressively done as Malaysia has done. So they're definitely, absolutely, I see that clearly. And in the data uh, analysis that I've done, you see that too. Um, and then, with regard to uh, China's, this is a great question, something that I've been thinking about, the lack of money that China has to continue infrastructure spending going into the future. Uh, so so I, 
One point in this regard is to look at, and nobody has done this to my knowledge, it's something that I'm thinking would be interesting to do, is to look at how China is engaging differently with countries in these debt uh, negotiations vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Paris Club members, for example. So does China have different uh, approaches to negotiating with electoral hypocrisies versus electoral democracies? And I, I certainly expect that there are important differences based on the volume of lending that has occurred on the part of electoral democracies. <laughs> there must be some important differences. Um, so that's a, something to look at next. Um, and then the question is, will they have money in the Will they have money in the future? So China has, has accumulated uh, a large volume of, of US dollar holdings comparable to what they had at the beginning of the BRI. Um, so I think on the one hand, they're, they're learning as they go about the risks to engaging in these infrastructure projects, trying to be more careful about which ones that they support. They don't want to have loss making projects. They want profitability with the projects, the SOEs that are initiating these projects are not profit maximizing like pro private firms, right? That's an important point, um, but they do need to be profitable. Um, and so China going forward is going to reassess which projects that they are going to commit to, um, but I think it will evolve. The, the nature of the BRI project will evolve, but I don't think that's going to mean it's going to it may be scaling back for the you know near term, but I think it will continue uh, in the longer term, partly because the gap between the demand for infrastructure development versus the supply of capital to address that demand is so huge. Uh, it's like a, if I'm not mistaken, it's like a $28 trillion gap between 2016 and 2030. Right. And China is contributing about $2 trillion optimistically to meeting, helping countries meet that need. So there's just this incredible unmet demand for infrastructure. And that means a great opportunity for China. So we've got a pretty deep uh, list of people on the queue. It's a bit like an auction house. If you made eye contact with me, you made a deal. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so I'll turn over to Karas next, um, and we'll keep things moving so that everyone can get a shot. All right, I'll try to be quick about this. Um, I'm intrigued by the difference between electoral autocracies and electoral democracies <laughs> that you find in your data, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what you think the, the mechanism driving that difference is. Yes. Uh, and I invite you especially to speak about the Malaysia yes. case since you brought it up. The Jeep lost in 2008. Yes, yes. Uh, that, to my mind, looks like a shift towards electoral democracy there. Mm -hmm. uh, given what the data show, we would expect Malaysia to be less uh, hospitable to China's investment. Do we see that, number one? And uh, number two, if that's the case, is it greater transparency, greater rule of law, or something else that's driving that shift? Right, thank you. Yeah, that's a... So... Yeah, so the, Indonesia and Malaysia are just really nice cases to illustrate the differences between these two political regimes. Um, in Malaysia, you see these very large, there's like six mega projects where you have a Chinese SOE partnering with a Malaysian SOE to build these projects worth more than 500 million US dollars. And a couple notable projects are two gas pipelines that went down the west coast of Malaysia and the east coast rail line, rail link. Um, and they were used by Najib to help funnel money to pay for the debts of a sovereign wealth fund owned that con he controlled and it got exposed, of course. And this is partly what led to his downfall in 2018. And so, as you indicate, so it did lead to a drop, a sudden drop. In the next year, Mahathir came in. It's sort of a, it's a, to say that it was a shift to electoral democracy may be a step too far because Mahathir, of course, was the previous yes. prime minister of the country when it was an electoral autocracy. And I think many people regard that it is still uh, an electoral autocracy. Yes. Uh, there was a dip, but that was during the uh, Mahathir renegotiated the project. It was a criticism he lobbed at Najib for paying too much. And 
this is why uh, that's what gave him the money to then allocate. Uh, so they renegotiate. So there's a dip in the subsequent year, but then there was a reinvigoration by Mahathir, attracting more money again back to Malaysia. So, so it's consistent ultimately with what I argue you should see. In Indonesia, the biggest project there is the Indonesia Morawali Industrial Park, which is private, a private Indonesian conglomerate and a private Chinese conglomerate located in Shanghai, actually. And it's devoted to nickel mining and refining. There is the uh, Jakarta Bandung uh, high speed rail project, but that's had a lot of problems. And the Japanese have been invited back in to help rectify those issues. But that's sort of the, if you're going to look at one mega project in Indonesia that's in a way equivalent to Malaysia's mega, that would be it. But it's problematic to say it's the same as the Malaysian project with regard to the state's control over the way it's being implemented. So to get to your point about the mechanism, so it's very clear in Malaysia, it's a, uh, these projects are a mechanism to reward political support or to woo potential voters or political supporters into his coalition uh, to ensure that he gets adequate votes to sustain his hold on power, uh, the prime minister that is, and his, and his party. Whereas in Indonesia, the prime minister and the ruling party very much depend on financing provided by the owners of these family owned conglomerates, right? The private conglomerates. So that means they must give them privilege uh, when they're negotiating with China for these projects. They're the ones who are gonna more often control how the projects get implemented. It's not occurring through the state-owned enterprises so much. Right. Um, thank you very much for the uh, really fascinating talk. I enjoyed it very much. <clears throat> um, so I, I guess, um, a few questions. So I'm I'm enormously sympathetic with the electoral autocracy result, which I kind of take as the the really kind of core point of the talk, right? Which is that electoral autocracies, um, the the data suggest, um, are kind of particular, uh, particularly um, substantial recipients of Chinese aid and investment and such. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm I'm enormously sympathetic to that. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm just kind of trying to think more about why this is, right? So, um, so you, you mentioned that you know the most of the world's autocr electoral autocracies are in sub-Saharan Africa, right? So, so I can think of sort of three pretty substantial reasons that we might expect them to be sort of particularly substantial uh, recipients, or at least more so than you know, than other countries. So you mentioned the clientelism thing, right? It, with respect to to Malaysia, in, in particular, you know, as a way. Um, for the incumbent to sort of target these projects, right? In, in Africa, I think that's pretty actually well accepted. Um, there's a wonderful paper by the Aid Data Group that shows that um, Chinese aid projects are far more likely to go to uh, the native regions of, of African autocrats, much more so than Democrats in ways that World Bank projects aren't, right? So there's something sort of like, um, I think uh, sort of genuinely, um, uh, Something kind of particular about Chinese aid projects that, that facilitates this. So I, so I think you're on something in, in Africa, and, and I think it's pretty, pretty well accepted. But I suppose the other thing, though, or kind of two other things that that I can imagine are also relevant. So, so you know, Af most African autocracies much less affluent than most closed autocracies, right? Which I gather are have not heavily, but not entirely in OPEC, right? And so consequently, um, I can imagine that a really important part of the story um, would be increased demand, right? Relative to closed autocracies. Yeah. And then and then and so then that would account for you know kind of the premium over closed autocracies. And then if I was and then you know another I think idea that some of the data group suggested with respect to um, democracies is that, you know, Africa's electoral autocracies have much weaker property rights, right? And so consequently um, are kind of locked out of, um, you know, lending markets uh, the, in the private sector, certainly, but also from the Bretton Woods institutions, at least relative to, to the common democracies. So, so I guess I'm kind of curious um, to what extent um, these other kind of mechanisms are, are, are also quite salient in, in your mind. Um, with respect, to, I, I wasn't quite so, and, and then you mentioned that 
you know, um, the regime type findings were, were robust to sort of various statistical estimators. And I, and I feel like, you know, that's one of those things where uh, it's like a math problem. It's important to kind of show one's work for that so we can kind of really um, kind of understand sort of what the, what the models are. Um, but yeah, I, I wish, wish you could talk more about um, to what extent you think the, the Africa electoral autocracy result is really kind of also being driven by these other dynamics. Um, that would be really helpful. Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, let me just speak to your first point, low income yeah. uh, in electoral autocracies, that's often common and it distinguishes them from many closed autocracies, as you indicated, which are oil rich monarchies frequently. And I would argue that that level of uh, the low income uh, of many of those electoral autocracies is in fact a key driver of what makes clientelism so effective. Because when you have a large group of poor people, it is easy to buy their vote, buy their loyalty. And so as a leader, if you can allocate money, and, and Malaysia did this actually under Najib and, and his predecessors, uh, and this happens in Africa and South America for that matter, you divert resources to a particularly uh, poor group of people uh, in order to get them to be your loyal supporters. And it takes less money to do that, the poorer they are. So uh, that's- that's, uh, that's so a the key. difference between electoral autocracies and closed autocracies in that respect would be that the voters kind of want more patronage that it's more effective, that China's foreign spending is more effective. In a closed autocracies, I mean, they, so it's a little bit different in closed autocracies because they don't have elections. And so the leaders don't feel the same need to buy the votes of the vast swath of the population. Uh, really, they just care about the elites who are surrounded by them, where they're surrounded by the large merchants, wealthy business owners and other political uh, elites, typically. Um, so that drives a greater demand for clientelist resources on the part of electoral autocracies. They have elections, so they need to show some veneer of legitimacy to being elected. So that makes their need for clientelist resources greater. Um, with regard to uh, electoral autocracies lacking access to debt markets. Um, that's absolutely true, um, but that's also true for electoral democracies. They also are not much, uh, they also have a similarly difficult uh, access to debt market, or at least a similarly low level of GDP per capita mm -hmm. to electoral autocracies. Electoral autocracies are a little bit uh, lower income. But with respect to their access to debt markets, there's not a big difference. And so then why, you know, in that, uh, so why is there such a big difference with regard to Chinese foreign spending to electoral autocracies, but not electoral democracies? Democracies receive bread and wood support. Anyway, yeah, yeah. I'm, sort of, I'm trying to think, you know. Right, I'll turn it else sort of driving this, this sure. numbers, which, which I do find interesting, but. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to pull a couple of questions from the feed uh, from our remote audience, maybe put them together. Um, you mentioned the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act a little earlier, and, and partly I think also it was relevant to your um, answer to the question I posed at the beginning. But um, one of our attendees really asked the question, many of the countries and the regions of the world that are dominated by electoral autocracies also have profound political corruption and elite capture. Um, why should the United States compete in these environments? And can the United States compete in environments where it isn't just about delivering aid that is valuable on the merits, meeting infrastructure needs and so forth, but it is also about political elites and economic elites taking a cut off the top of any contract that comes their way in a way that is very difficult for the for aid from liberal democracies and multilateral lending institutions to compete against. Mm -hmm. You know. I, what how how do we even get in there and do we want to compete in those spaces and get dragged down to that level yeah so that's 
I think that's a difficult question, given that there has been this very important effort to uh, reduce the ability of American companies to engage in corruption, to facilitate the uh, continuation of rulers who depend on corrupt rule. Um, and the World Bank launched an important initiative uh, complementing that or preceding that, or following that rather, I should say. Good governance was such a big piece of their lending. Right, exactly. And so, right, so now I'm sort of quite, I, I'm, I, let me say, I'm not question. I'm not saying that we should backtrack from that. First of all, let me say that I think we should maintain that, but I think we should reframe uh, how we think about what's happening and what the FCPA may be unintentionally doing. So I think when you look at the bigger picture with regard to the distribution of global GDP and which power, which country is gaining greater access to those economies, the trends are favoring China in developing and emerging economies. And the IMF itself projects that they will account for nearly two thirds of global GDP by the end of this decade. And so if you don't want to engage in projects in those countries, then you're, you may sacrifice this bigger issue about who controls the global political economy. And, and your commitment to the FCPA may be moot by that point in some ways. There's one factor that I don't think you're adequately weighing, which is that the people of these countries are not ha happy about having their leaders take corrupt under the table payments from the Chinese Communist Party state. And in a number of countries, we have or could have as allies, the societies of these countries. Uh, and so uh, one way of, um, dealing with this problem is dumbing down our own practices to in one way or another through whatever euphemism you wanna use, enable our companies to once again, which I think they're probably already doing in very oblique ways through the you know, intermediaries and representatives that they hire in these countries mm -hmm. uh, compete in this way. But the other is to level the playing field by making it more difficult for China to bribe these people and lifting up independent media, civil society organizations, corruption monitoring organizations and so on so they can't get away with this. And um, I'm not sure that isn't a better approach. So so I think that's a great point. I, I, yeah. I, so I feel like I was sort of saying we should get rid of the FCPA, and I didn't mean to say yeah, that. Yeah, no, you didn't say that. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to give that impression either. Um, but absolutely. So I think Malaysia is a good example where exactly as you're saying, you see a group of people, especially the middle class, emerging and increasingly large middle class in many of these developing countries get angry about corruption because they're the ones who are having their money being diverted uh, away from productive uses to pay for these corrupt practices. So I think that's a great point. That's something that the US or other organizations can contribute is to helping shed light on what's happening to mobilize domestic you know, voice against those practices. The other thing I think that is necessary, and I go back, goes back to my concluding slide about what, what the US needs to do, and that is provide financial mechanisms to make it attractive for private companies to compete with Chinese companies for projects in these countries. And is that loan guarantees, export import bank? What is that? So uh, I don't, I have the, the federal insurance uh, for overseas. So I haven't explored in detail what the appropriate mechanisms would be. Maybe some or all of those, but there needs to be an examination. I want to give everyone a chance who's in the queue, so maybe pose a, a narrow question and a briefer answer, and then we'll we'll keep things moving. Um, I think Jim, you're in the queue next. <clears throat> thank, thank you, and thank you for this. Do you give this talk or some version of it in Shanghai? And, and what sort of reaction? Do you get? <laughs> so that's a, thank you for that. Um, so I did give a version of this talk at the EU Chamber of Commerce uh, about a month ago. And uh, 
they were very receptive. Um, uh, they were they really uh, valued the insights I offered with respect to the digital uh, technology exports and the um, competitive advantage China is gaining relative to Western uh, country governments and businesses and how that might yield long-term advantages. Um, so these were like CEOs of uh, major company, Western companies, primarily from the EU, but some American as well. Um, I also give, I, I teach a course at the China Europe Inter International Business School that is very closely related to many of the topics I discuss here. And they're aged 40 to 45, around that age, and they come from all over the world. And they really like, it. it's one of their favorite courses. Um, so I get, yeah, I, 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 it's one of the favorite courses. And I teach it also to MBA students and they also really like it. In fact, the favorite topic among all the Chinese audiences that I teach is about the likelihood of war between the US and China and the risk of that. And the reason they like that so much is because in the context of a classroom, you feel you have an open safe space in which to talk intelligently about these things. And you can frame your opinion, not as a subjective view, but in the context of an analytical framework that I give you. So it's not your viewpoint, it's the framework telling you what the likely outcome is. So it's a safe way of expressing their opinion. I'm glad I'm next in the queue because I was also going to ask about your teaching experience and your students, and particularly to pick up on a thread from the beginning of your presentation, where you talked about how you're drawing on qualitative insights for many of your students who've come from these developing countries or come from countries where China has had investment, have been on the ground in managerial or executive positions. So I'm curious, are there things that you learned from your interlocutors that you want to highlight? And then also pulling back one level how open were your interlocutors and has that changed, especially as COVID and rising tensions? Yeah, great question. Thank you for asking me that question because it gives me a chance to say something I want to say. Um, so yeah, so one of the great um, uh, opportunities I had to talk about uh, some of these, talk about what, some of these projects with somebody is um, the way ZTE would win contracts in Algeria, which is an electoral autocracy. Um, and so that sort of gave me very specific insight into the mechanisms by which uh, the government can influence the way projects are allocated in a politically beneficial way. So specifically, the government would invite bids on building 5G infrastructure from all different countries. Um, and they would provide a list of a specific set of subcontractors or favored firms who, if included in the bid, would let that bid have more points uh, when it was evaluated against other bids. So whoever, whichever company had the highest number of points in their bid would win the contract. And so you could elevate your points by including a specific list of companies as part of your uh, group of subcontractors or other kinds of firms uh, in your proposal. And that was, and that list was a private list given only to specific firms when they were submitting their bid. Uh, so that was, and that list of firms, of course, was the group of firms who were regarded as politically allied to the leader of Algeria. And so you see similar mechanisms like that. I mean, permutations of it happening in other countries, but that was sort of a very nice and vivid example of how this happens. Um, and yeah, so. And then I was wondering also how open your students have been and if that openness has shifted against COVID and against the backdrop of sort of rising US-China tension. So I think in general, they're very open. Uh, so at first, I think there's a lot of hesitation when I begin teaching or when they first meet me. Uh, so typically the way I really get to know students and get to talk to them is after I teach them for a period of time. And in the selective course that I teach, it's over the you know, it's over a course of, of uh, several weeks for MBA students or three days for executives, but I teach them in other courses as well. So yeah, at first I sometimes get hostility or sometimes challenges 
They want to test if I am being, you know, my political loyalty or, you know, ch check where I'm coming from politically. And I, you know, and the way I try to counteract that is I will critique the United States as well. And I will say the United States is not, you know, the gleaming beacon on the hill that Americans like to pretend it is. It has a lot of problems. And I'll be the first to point them out and talk about them. And the more they hear what I have to say, the more they trust me. That's yeah. basically what it is, right? Establishing trust. Uh, that I'm not going to use what they say against them or use it in a manipulative or bad way. I'm just trying to understand what's happening. And, um, and that's typically, and so at first they're a little bit hesitant, but once they get, get to know me and trust me, they open up. All right, Christian. Yeah, <clears throat> really great talk. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Richard. Um, I have actually a short technical question. Speaking, you know, you mentioned in your talk that you see some examples of um, China uh, as part of the digital Silk Road imposing tech standards. Um, now, I'm aware in the 90s there was a big push by China to stop paying royalty payments for TDS and develop its own indigenous technology standards like TDS, CDMA, and I had thought that it all kind of fallen by the wayside. So I'm wondering like, what would, you know, can you talk about any specific examples of in these projects, which tech standards uh, are being promoted and, and were they adopted? Yes. Um, I'm very tempted to pull up a slide. Uh, or a, so I have a, I'll just tell you, um, I have a table uh, in my book. So I look at smart city affiliated uh, technologies that are exported to countries. And there's like a, a list of seven categories of technologies, uh, mm -hmm. surveillance, municipal services. Um, uh, I forget all of them now, but there's like seven different categories. And within each of those general categories are many specific products. And uh, so, I mean, each of those individual products uh, and affiliated services has uh, specific standards uh, that will be decided um, that, well, they, they will, they can use this. I, so the example I use in the book, I, I give a very simple example about railway bridges. Yeah. And maybe, I don't know if this is what you're after. I don't think it's what you're after because you want to know the specific technical standards well, related to digital products. You don't products. have to tell us the specific technical standard, but it's just more the question of, um, you know, are they promoting standards that don't have interoperability with other, is that what yes, you're yes, saying there? That's right. That's exactly right. With non-Chinese technologies, that is what they're promoting. Is it non-Chinese or just maybe specific to that company? So if Huawei comes in with a smart city thing and says yeah. you need to use Huawei stuff, is so, that what you mean or do you mean? No. I mean, so the government tries to establish standards that are common across all Chinese companies so that all the companies in China will abide by those same standards. It's different from Western. So that's part of what makes it challenging for Western companies to compete effectively in the context of uh, digital standards organizations, for example, yeah. uh, because they're fragmented and you have each large multinational Western company proposing its own standards and they will fight, compete mm -hmm. to win. China comes in and they're unified in promoting one set of standards typically. And Huawei is often the helm leading this effort because they're the biggest participant among Chinese companies. But what's really, but I think even more influential than that effort uh, is the, the implementation of de facto standards, ignoring the standards that... So do you think the standards, like the push of these standards in these areas is a byproduct of the fact that China goes for its own standards anyway? because it has an antipathy towards royalty payments and yes. wants to develop its own stuff. And this yeah. is a secondary result of that. Or do you think this is, or does your research show that this is something that is part and parcel of, of the digital initiatives overseas to lock in these? It is, it is part of that. Yes, there's an explicit. So in 2015, there was an explicit initiative to include 
digital standards as part of the building of infrastructure projects. Yeah. The integrating sensors, digital sensors, and other kinds of digital equipment into the building of infrastructure to make it smart infrastructure and to have them using Chinese technical standards. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for a rich discussion, for an excellent presentation. Richard, I remind our audience that his book will be out towards the end of this year on Cambridge University Press. So look for it. And um, that concludes this meeting. Thank you. <laughs>